Well, hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us. I'm going to start the uh, webinar now. This has got uh, the magic 30 plus number, so that's great. Um, so uh, I'm Stephen Darby. I'm the uh, Events and Awards Director for Aura, and I just uh, thought I'd do a very quick introduction and welcome Dan back. So Dan Young from Shed Research is joining us, and um, Shed have spent 10 years uh, well, was set up by Dan about 10 years ago, uh, working both agency and client sites. Um, and their USP is that they help businesses unlock insight from what they already have, which I think we'll all probably be finding quite important at the moment, given that it's quite likely that budgets might get pressed over the coming months. Uh, Jan, uh, Jan, Dan joined us last week uh, to do the Aura seminar, first one online as well. So uh, thanks for being willing to get involved twice in a week. That's pretty impressive. Um, and he took us through how uh, Primark uh, helped to fix a business issue. So it's worth, if you haven't seen that and you haven't had and haven't had a chance to, to watch that, uh, go onto your website and have a look because it's excellent and it was uh, well, it is well worth the uh, the time. Um, so in this webinar, it's going to be Dan's going to be taking us through how to do more with less. So I will. Um, hand over to Dan in, about, in a couple of seconds, but just if you've got any questions, there's a Q&A option on the uh, webinar. I'm sure you're all very familiar with this now, given that we've all been locked down and, and doing this stuff for a while. So use it as you need to, and then we can address the questions at the end. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stephen. And hello, everybody. Thank you for, for dialing in today. Um, Welcome back if you listened to the session last week and if you didn't, as Stephen said, a recording is available. I'm going to take about 30 minutes to talk you through, as the title says, how to do more with less, so getting started with insight synthesis. So um, today's all about really doing more with the huge amount of research and data that exists in most organisations, most, most industries. So, of course, when you get a new business question, you could commission a new piece of research, and that is how people would tend to to approach that but is that right um i'm going to talk today a lot about how you can curate assimilate synthesize what you already have um for the purpose of today i'm going to call it synthesis because otherwise i'll start using too many words and, and get myself in a in a muddle um i'm going to show you how we do it and how you can do it too as steven said been doing this for a long time and, and this is absolutely our, our specialism so there's a lot to it so i've tried to break it down to manageable chunks and give you tips and tools and, and sources to help you. So we're going to talk about five things here today. So why you should synthesize, why it's a great time to start, uh, why it's not only quicker and more cost effective but actually more robust as well. Give you four steps from a, a tried and tested process to arm you with the skills you need to, to try this yourself. Uh, we're going to talk through some of the, the tools, the software, the sources of, it, of further information that can help, and also the common mistakes that, that people make and how best to avoid them. And as I go, I'll give you examples of things we've done just to bring this all to life. So I'm hoping that all of you are already open to the idea of synthesis, otherwise you wouldn't have dialed in today. But you may still need convincing, or you may have people within your organization, skeptical stakeholders, who you need to bring along with you. You need to convince them. They may have a preference for a new project, new data. There may be some, some tension there. So I'm going to start with really the reasons why I think synthesis is so important. Um, Colin Powell, uh, ex-Secretary of State in the United States, he wrote a fantastic book and he talks about how he made decisions. He was talking about the battlefield. I don't think we're talking about the battlefield here today, but his argument was when he made decisions where he had under 40% of the information, he didn't have enough. He was basically just guessing, very poor decision making. When he waited for over 70% of the information, actually he'd waited too long. Uh, he'd missed his opportunity. He'd missed his kind of first mover advantage. Um, opportunity lost uh, and none of us want to see that. For him, the sweet spot was between 40 and 70 percent. So you have enough information to make the right decision but you're not waiting too long to collect more and more information. So if we relate this to what we do, we probably have all of the uh, insight and research within our organisation or easily accessible outside our organisation to come to this 40 to 70 percent i mean you may not be happy with that you you may uh, like to have more maybe 80 to, to 90 percent 
But ultimately, if research is all about making decisions, and I think we all agree that that's what it's there to do for people to make a decision to act on, it may be you have a lot of the answers in your business already, be it in reports, transcripts, data sets, CRM systems, industry research, public opinion data, whatever it is. So the trick really is, is uncovering those. And that's what, thankfully, I'm going to talk about here today. So it feels like the perfect time to start. Um, obviously, I won't go into the detail of our current situation, but things are, are changing. They have changed dramatically. They will continue to change, I suspect. So we're entering a new global era. And as with every period of adversity, it also presents an opportunity to, to do things differently. So you may find that you have more time in your day. You, you, you may not find this, but, um, but some people will find that they've got a little bit more more time, uh, they won't be commissioning as much primary research, budgets being squeezed, they won't be investing so much in new product development, maybe at the moment, most research will be focused on coronavirus, COVID-19, they won't be spending time commuting as well. Um, you obviously got the, the added pressures of being a teacher for some, um, and you're not getting that time maybe a way to reflect on, on your work and on life in, in general, but for a lot of people, there will be a net gain in, in time. And I would argue that you could use this time to, to synthesize your data. Um, I always use a, a food analogy to talk about synthesis. And I talked about this last week and I'll, I'll go through it very, very quickly. But most research still at the moment follows a, a sort of cookery book approach. So you spend a lot of time choosing the right recipe for the right occasion. You write down the list of the ingredients that you need. You go out to the shop. You come back, you prepare your ingredients, you follow a set list of instructions, you can start from scratch there to make this, this lovely meal. It's great, but it's actually a very, very lengthy process, quite costly as well. Um, in research terms, that's how a lot is done, assuming that nothing existed before. So everything sort of lives in, in isolation. Um, I know a lot of agencies will talk about using what's, what's gone before, but uh, in my experience, that doesn't always happen perhaps to its fullest. I would argue a better thing to do is what we've all been doing throughout any food shortage that you might have experienced and actually look at what you've already got. And uh, just to say that my store cover is absolutely nothing like this and certainly a lot, a lot messier, but make a delicious meal from what you've already got. It's, it's quicker, it's leaner, it's, it's more resourceful um, using what already exists. I mean, typically when I do this sort of process, a sort of a classic synthesis would take between one and four weeks. Um, if it's something quite small, you can do it within the day or an afternoon. Uh, if it's looking at all of the research that you've undertaken in the last five years, then that's going to take a, a lot longer, obviously. So just to give you an idea, it, you know, it varies in length. I suppose like any piece of research varies in length. I'd also argue it's more robust. Um, this isn't intended to be a comprehensive list of all the different sources of information that you have access to, but uh, a lot of research, if we think about research in isolation, individual project, we may have some actions coming out of an individual project. Um, but should we really be changing our company strategy based on a single project? Or should we be looking at our research in its entirety, viewing it in context and actually building a more comprehensive, more robust view, drawing from everything that we have? I would argue that the, the second is, is preferable to lead to some genuine insight and genuine action. Uh, and if that hasn't convinced you uh, of the need to, to synthesize, this is a, a stat from the MRS client survey presented at the MRS conference in, in March. Uh, I've asked questions to find out exactly where this came from, a bit of background. Um, I haven't been able to get it for, for today, unfortunately. But regardless of who was surveyed here, I think we all recognize this issue, the issue that a lot of insight hasn't yet been used in our organization. Obviously, that's a huge frustration to, to a lot of people, and all of us want to see research acted upon so I think it's it's fair to say that there is stuff there that that hasn't been used to its fullest and what about using that as a catalyst for action rather than new research so lots of different times that you might turn to synthesis um, lots of different situations lend themselves to it you may be interested in a strategic insight overview what do we know in what areas aligning to our company strategy and where have we got gaps you might want to do a sort of state of the nation report. Where are we now? Where are we headed? 
really useful for new joiners um, just to tell them what you know, like sort of voice of the customer report or bringing on new agencies to bring them up to speed. You might want to drill down into specific interesting customer journeys or particularly, particularly pivotal ones for your, your business, customer or segment playbooks. Um, if you're about to embark on a large new project, a huge amount of spend, I think it makes sense to take stock of what you already have. If you're reviewing your trackers, um, think about are you asking the right questions go back to the original data do a bit of digging check that you're asking all the right things uh, of your your customers and, and non-customers or a deep dive into a, a particular customer segment so lots of different situations i mean no, there are many more besides this but just to give you a flavor of when you might want to synthesize okay so um what are the steps what what should you be be doing so i'm going to try to to take you through that here today and for once i'm actually saying do try this at home so four steps uh, as i say tried and tested process for us the first is exploring so understanding and theming what's already there so going through all of your your insight extracting actually digging a bit deeper sometimes that involves further data analysis sometimes it involves going back to data tables going back to, to transcripts then the third stage is enhancing what you know. This is where we fill the gaps. We look for external sources of information, maybe do some more reading. Um, we may actually have to do some new primary research because we can't find the answers elsewhere and it's particularly pivotal. At this point, there may be some cyclical uh, movement between stages two and three. So you actually may have to go back to the original data and then go and do some more reading. But those two sort of work in, in unison and then the last stage is really elevating what you've got to some clear directional output, something that's really easy to digest, really easy to act on. So the first stage, exploring. So it's really important to set your objective. Um, you could be dealing with a huge amount of information. It's very, very easy to, to get lost in that information, to be swayed, to be distracted, to go down a rabbit hole, to go down a tunnel, choose your metaphor. Um, but really, really important, like any research, I suppose, to be uh, tight on your objective and don't lose sight of that. I'd really recommend speaking to stakeholders. You'll probably have a pretty good handle on all of the pieces of insight that are in your organisation. Stakeholders, particularly in strategy teams, they may have access to other information, maybe market sales data, um, things that could be really useful to you here. So bring them into the process, tell them what you're doing um, and they can make this process so much better. There's no way around this, unfortunately. Uh, there's a lot of reading. Uh, you have to read, and as you, as you read, categorize what you're reading, the insights by theme. Uh, that's really, really important. So when you're theming, think about your company strategy. Do you want to theme by the different pillars of your company strategy? Do you want to theme by uh, particular segments, the steps on a customer journey? different channels of engagement, maybe your different business silos, if you work in a, in a siloed business, lots of tools out there to, to help you theme. Um, my personal preference is, is visualizing. And I've got an example on the slide here of a, a Coggle visualization, it's Coggle.it, and I'll, I'll talk you through some of the other tools available a bit later. But it's a really, really neat way of seeing all of your insight on a single page. And I think if you're reading, say, a thousand pages of, of research, Stilling it into 50 pages of research is useful, but it's not actually that useful. Seeing it at one page, that's really, really useful. You can get a good feel for where you've got more insight, where you've got less insight, what the, the gaps are, and a really, really useful reference tool for the future as well. So I'm just going to talk you through an example of, of uh, how we used a visualization tool to provide a bit of clarity to synthesis process. So Alzheimer's Research UK, anyone who works in the charity sector knows that it's really challenging at the moment. Average donations are, are, are going down, but Alzheimer's Research actually had a record few years. They had some fantastic celebrity endorsements, Brian Cranston from Breaking Bad and a fantastic advertising campaign led to record donations. They set uh, some five year targets for the organisation and actually met them within three years. So brilliant but they wanted to take stock and think about the next phase of their development. So they brought me in to, to synthesize, to simulate everything into a succinct report, everything that they knew. I used this visual tool. And if I just go back a slide, this is actually the, the, the problem that, that I used. And you can see on the left-hand side, 
huge amount in red on one topic, that was messaging. And that's because it's incredibly hard to talk about Alzheimer's and dementia for them. So it's a degenerative disease, so uh, it's quite hard to talk about it without being too depressing. Um, but what they're involved in is actually the scientific side of that, scientific advances, hard to talk about that without being too technical. So they were trying to strike this balance all the time. So they spent a lot of uh, time and effort researching that one topic. I was able to go in and say, actually, you've got all of the answers to how to talk about this. And in a single slide, here are the do's and don'ts of messaging. And then they were able to move on. They were able to not, not spend any more money on researching messaging because they did have those answers already. So the next stage is about extracting meaning. So you'll have lots of questions as you've been reading everything. I keep a, a log to the side. Uh, again, I do this, this visually. So questions that you've got about the, the studies, questions you've got about why certain things have been covered and why other things haven't. You have to look back at the original data. That means revisiting sometimes raw data or transcripts or videos, um, again, to answer the questions that you have. Sometimes you can't answer your questions and you actually need to do some more analysis. I've been in situations where we've uh, rerun some uh, key driver analysis that, that wasn't giving us what, what we needed from the original data set. Uh, comparing your methodology, so not all insight is equal. So it may be that some fairly big claims made in one study, but looking at the method, actually, that was a fairly small qualitative exercise. And actually, that insight came from one group on a wet Tuesday in North London, should we be changing our business strategy based on that? Perhaps not. So we need to be thinking really critically. We need to be addressing the contradictions that you, you will see, and you will see contradictions in your, your insight. And the way to, to deal with comparing methodologies, the way to deal with any contradictions is to think really critically, be objective. I'm sure you all are. You're all the voice of the customer within your organization so so use that be objective about the insight even if you've been involved in it think critically and as i said with the first stage collaboration really really important to be working together sharing what you're finding with others if you could team up with someone in a sort of buddy system within the insight team i think that could work really really well so you can keep each other motivated keep sharing what what you're finding and you'll actually build a much better story as a result Here's an example of uh, some work that we did with JISC. So if you don't know about JISC, they are a digital services provider for the education sector. They do regular study with uh, HE and FE leaders. So the vice chancellors of universities, the heads of, of colleges, sixth form colleges. Um, they've previously done some really good analysis on this, this MPS study, but it was lacking a bit of clarity. Uh, it was hard for them to extract meaning. So. What we did, we went back to basics. We went back to, okay, MPS has moved from here to here, but why is that? We were looking a lot at the verbatim comments over the previous years, and it was very, very clear when we looked at all of those and fully coded them, actually there were seven themes, seven things that this organization could do to improve its MPS in the future. So when we had those seven things, it was really easy to then workshop those, to develop actions, to talk about the barriers to actions, to assign those actions to individuals. Just by going back to the raw data, we're able to, to sort of fast forward to actually some concrete actions. So the next stage is all about enhancing. So this is about the gaps. Uh, you'll have questions, you, you wanna answer these, these, these gaps. So you can look outside to external sources, and I'll talk about some of those in a, in a minute, but um, your, your segmentation, your media agency will have a fantastic data set that they have access to, behavioral theory, market reports, all of those sorts of things. They may answer the, the questions that you have the, the, or fill the gaps rather of uh, your insight, or you may need to commission something new. Sometimes that's necessary. I would argue that it should be as lean as possible. So it may be you've got a study from a few years ago and it's giving you the majority of, of what you need, but there's some nervousness in the organization. Actually, can we trust this from three years ago? What you could do is rerun a smaller version of the study, maybe with just some of the key measures, just to see if anything's changed, just to reassure people. Much more efficient to do that than commission the whole study again. Um, and when you have done this further reading or done this, this new research, you may then want to go back a stage and revisit the original data. So as I said, it can be a sort of cyclical thing between stages two and three. 
So a really good example, I think, of this is some work we did for the Money Advice Service. They regularly undertake a survey looking at the financial capability of everybody in the UK. They know that from that there are some vulnerable groups. One of those is older people in retirement. As you can see from this chart, as soon as people get 75, their ability to read a bank statement, their ability to do a simple calculation of uh, if you have £100 and it's got an interest rate of 2%, what is that £100 worth in one year? Simple maths like that, uh, around about half of them getting that wrong. So we knew that it was an issue, we knew financial capability was an issue amongst this audience, but actually why? We wanted to know why, and there's nothing in the data that was telling us that. So we looked outside. The International Longevity Centre did a huge amount of research and Age UK as well. And actually there were two things at play here. One was a cohort effect. Actually, those who are over 75, the standard of education they had when they were younger was significantly poorer than the standard of education that subsequent generations have had. So they didn't have as good a, an education. And then the other side of that is probably what you guessed, there's cognitive decline. That's a normal part of a, an aging brain. So we're able to, just by looking outside, doing some further reading, answer the why question, which was missing from the original data. So the fourth stage is about elevating what you have. So uh, I would say any insight project is, is judged on its, its outputs. And it's really important to, to get this right. So choose your framework for your report or whatever it, it may be. Uh, you could build it around a customer journey. So from them not knowing about you through to them maybe experiencing a competitor's product or service and then leaving you. What's going on at every stage? You could structure it by the silos of your business segments, the pillars of your company strategy, whatever works in your organization. And of course it will depend on your objectives. So let your objectives lead the, the framework. Um, I've, I've used all of those and I think they all work equally well in, in different situations. Tackle the myths as well. There will be myths in any organization. There are, um, some will be based on facts, some will be based on fiction, and it's really important to address those up front. So just, just tackle those. Actually, the things that we all assume to be the case, are they really the case? Tell a story. This is probably a, a, an aura session all by itself, uh, and you probably have, have had them, so I won't cover this in huge amounts of detail, but you know the importance of telling a story. Um, the Heat book, Made to Stick, fantastic. Uh, resource for that so the need for stories to be really simple to be unexpected to, to have an element of shock uh, to be concrete credible and also emotional to stick um, and I would say being really really clear and I hope I'm being clear here here today it's fairly obvious thing to say um, I, I would never say be opaque but uh, I'd read a lot of research from our industry and uh, a lot of it still will talk about how we can do something to drive brand engagement, how we can follow a particular advertising route because it's more motivating, or it's more resonating. And I always stop and think, well, what does that actually mean? What, what are we saying here? Are we saying people are more likely to buy the product? Are we saying people are more likely to renew the contract? Are we saying people are more likely to give to, to our charity? What are we actually saying in concrete terms? If we are saying those things, then we should say them. We should be clear. We shouldn't be, be afraid of, of being bold. And in terms of being bold, short and punchy, uh, always it, it is best, get straight to the point. I always read my slides aloud, do they make sense? So uh, have you written as you, you speak? Then you know that you'll have impact. Um, and just give some clear direction, really, really uh, important to give a, a clear path for your stakeholders, particularly for senior stakeholders. So I'll just give you a quick example of, of how we gave that, that clear path. This is what I talked about last week, so I won't go into this in a huge amount of detail, but this is something that we did for Primark, looking at German shoppers. They had a sales issue in Germany. Um, so we talked through what was driving this sales issue. We went through what was important to customers. That was our framework. So we went through the product, the in-store experience, price ethics awareness, and we gave two really clear actions for the organization to, to take forward. And it did lead to action and it led to a, a transformation of, of the business in that uh, in that market. So great, great result. Um, another example, this is putting together, and I'm sure you've read all of this, all of the COVID-19 research that's been pumped out by lots of different agencies, your Cervantes, your Ipsos Moris, your YouGovs, your, your GFKs, they're all putting out a huge amount of research, which is fantastic because it's a, it's a free resource for 
for all of us. I found I was a bit overwhelmed at the start of April by all of it. So I just pulled it together into a short six side summary for myself more than anything. And I have shared that and happy to share with you if, if you're interested. And I will up, update that again in, in the future. So if you're going to take a screen grab of anything today, this is the slide. Um, these are the stages. These are what I think you need to think about at every stage as you, you go through. So I said I'd put you through some, some tools to help you. So um, you could do all of this in your head, obviously. Uh, if you're like me, you're going to need a bit of help. And I, I tend to favour simplicity. It helps me to, to order my thoughts. I put software in inverted commas here because I think the, the, the main piece of software is obviously your mind. And some of these probably aren't even software, but tools to, to help you. Um, SharePoint or whatever document library you have within your organisation. I think you should be storing all of your insight, you should be categorizing and tagging it so that you know, as reports and research comes in, you know what it covers, what segments, what parts of the company strategy, all of those things that I've already mentioned. Um, other tools, again, you know, this looks like a, an advert for Microsoft, doesn't it? Um, other tools you could use, PowerPoint uh, and Word, just as a repository for the information. So as you get in new insight about, say, a, a segment, you could put it in, the PowerPoint slides of that segment. You're going to make something quite unwieldy, fairly linear. Um, probably wouldn't be my preference to take that approach, but maybe useful in a, in a rough form just to order your thoughts and just to pull everything into one place. My favourite, and I mentioned it earlier, is Coggle. Uh, fantastic spider diagrams, very, very visual, very colourful, very clear. It's good enough to actually show within the business. If you want a single slide of everything that you know, you can show people that really easy to put referencing on and use hyperlinks and those sorts of things. So I think that's a, that's a really good tool for, you, for the different themes that you've developed around your, your framework of your synthesis. Trello, traditionally used for project management, but could equally be used here. So each piece of insight that you have could have its own card, could be tagged, um, could be could be referenced with with notes as well so that that's something to think about some people like tables uh some people just find that easier to to deal with so you could put all of the different insights and all the different themes and all the different tags in a in an excel spreadsheet perfectly possible or you might be more traditional you might like a blank piece of paper a whiteboard post-its um, very, very visual, a bit like, like Coggle, but hard to share. And if you're collaborating with anyone, particularly as we are isolated at the moment, it's, that's going to be quite tricky to, to share and collaborate. So if we're all in a meeting room together and we could dedicate a whiteboard to it for, for the month, I would say that could be a good way to go. But at the moment, maybe not. And then there's Envivo as well. Anybody that, that's used that before, very, very powerful. Um, you can draw in images, video, audio, survey data, Word documents, Excel, all sorts of different types of uh, types of research and, and ultimately insights. And you can code it, you can theme it, you can have memos, you can, you can search by keywords as well. So really, really good, quite technical, um, and probably geared more towards an academic audience. But if, if that's your thing, then certainly give that a try. And the different sources that, that you can, can use. So I mentioned in the third stage of enhancing where to look. You can't beat Google, um, the good old fashioned search bar. Try lots of different terms for the same thing. Uh, you'll be amazed what you can find, what's freely available out there. So that's where I always start. The British Library, again, brilliant resource. They house most periodicals, publications that, that you can think of. Normally, I would get physical access to the, the library of St Pancras. Uh, obviously, that's not possible at the moment. Uh, there is a team that are able to answer questions, and I'm not uh, sure of their digital offer at the moment. I haven't had the course to, to use it over the last month. Um, I'm sure they're opening up their archive online, but it's a brilliant resource. They'll let you leave with certain sections of, of different reports, sometimes the, the whole report as well. So certainly worth exploring and free. Um, Government departments, regulators, industry trade bodies or, or NGOs, they're all undertaking a large amount of research. I mean, take, take finance, Stephen's sector. 
you've got the, the FCA, the Bank of England, PRA, Money Advice Service Base, they'll all be commissioning research and they're all really, really good at publishing that research, quite quite transparent. So it's really worth worth checking. ONS, much better site than it, it used to be, it takes a lot of time to search, but there's a lot of data there. The media publish research and they'll be often a route to more, more information. So they'll give the headlines, they'll give us a journalist's take on something. But you can actually go and, and, and find that maybe from the, uh, the company that commissioned it or the original source. Market reports, people like Mintel producing things. You've probably got access to these within your business, um, but a great, a great, great resource. British Library as well have, have a lot of those. Or our, uh, last but not least, our own beer sector. So YouGov, Ipsos Mori, all of these research houses, research factories are commissioning and publishing a huge amount of, of data. And it's always worth asking them questions as well. And I've had situations where I've found some useful data, but it hasn't quite been in the format I've wanted or the age breaks that I've wanted. I've gone back, I've asked the question, and they've been more than happy to share the, the, the data tables or give me the breakdowns that I've asked for for, for nothing, which is really generous of them. So uh, I suppose the point of attending today is all about learning how to do it. It's probably worth also covering how not to do it. So what are the common mistakes that, that people make when they're trying to synthesize their research it's very easy to get lost in the data so as i said earlier set your objective and stick to it avoid those blind alleys and those rabbit holes easy to lose focus so that's why collaborating and talking through what you're finding i think is is vital uh not knowing where all of your insight is so if you're new to the organization you might not know where everything is or um, you may have a, an organization where research is in pockets around the business so before you start spend time bringing it all together categorizing it tagging it a bit like a, a librarian function um, I think that's really really important because then you'll know what you've got and you'll know um, where where to go from there it's quite easy to be overwhelmed by all of this um, I know some organizations at the end of every study they do a single page summary of the report with what it covers the method main insights, the sort of, you know, tags to the strategy or segments that are, that are um, covered by it. So that's really useful. So if you're, if you're looking at, say, 50 different reports, um, reading 50 reports is a lot. Reading 50 single page summaries is not as much. Just to get your head around it, you'll have to obviously go back to the original research, but it may be a good place to start so you don't feel overwhelmed. It's also forgetting where insight is. So when you do read this amount of information, it's very easy to actually uh, read something in another report and think, ah, that relates to something I read somewhere else. But where was that? You can forget. So I always keep really clear referencing. I number all of the reports at the start. So when I find an insight and I put it in the Coggle, at the end in brackets, I'll have 12, page 59, and that's report 12, page 59. So I know exactly where um, to find that. So that's really, really important. Sometimes people don't know where to start, and this is probably the main question that people have come to me since last week and, and um, before today. Where do you start with something like this? I would recommend starting with the big pieces of research, those sort of seminal projects that really gained traction within the organisation. Or you could start chronologically. You could go back to the start and see how your insight as a team has developed over time. So it's, it's probably one of, one of those two. Um, in most situations, probably start with the, the big ones, start with the ones that have had most impact. Uh, avoid PowerPoint too soon. So I said you could, you could use PowerPoint as a tool to sort of chuck things into to, to sort of build your, your picture. But I think the mistake that most people make is launching into PowerPoint before they're ready, before they've really built their story. Actually, it should be very clearly planned. You should know exactly what you want to say. And then the PowerPoint part should be really really simple at the end and should be quite quick it's a bit like a writer you spend you should spend a lot of time planning what to write and not as much time actually writing um and a lot of people don't give it the time it needs and that's why a lot of people turn to us that they they try and actually they find that with the meeting requests and with the requests for for insight within the organization they aren't able to to devote the time that this needs but we're in a situation now where we are all locked away. Um, we may be in a position where we can clear our diaries, we can turn off email, whatever chat function you have within your business, and just focus on this because you do need to follow a train of thought. You need to have that sort of stream of consciousness. Um, so, so do give it the time that it needs. 
So I started with five things that I was going to cover. So in the spirit of symmetry, I'll leave you with five takeaways from today. Uh, so there's never, I don't think, been a better time to start something like this, to start synthesizing. Your budgets are likely to be under pressure. You can't do research the usual way, so why not give it a try? What have you got to lose? It's really important to find what works for you. So uh, you may prefer Excel, you may prefer Coggle, you may prefer Post-its, whatever works for you, and it will depend on exactly the type of synthesis that you're doing. Just try something, see if it work, works for you. That's absolutely fine. But don't lose sight of your objective. Really important to keep it tight and focused and then you'll get the best outcomes. Do work together. Um, if you are an insight team of one, find someone else within the organisation that, that you can share this with or within your team, do, do collaborate. It will really help, particularly when you're dealing with contradictory pieces of insight or you've got some questions about method just to talk it through with someone to really help build that story will will help and lastly as i said give it time um you, know, you do need to, to focus on on this um and it, it's a lot of reading and a lot of going back and a lot of cyclical thinking so don't underestimate that but we do have that time at the moment so do do devote it okay thank you um so if you uh, have any questions uh, I'd be delighted to hear them thank you Dan really interesting um, I think it's absolutely right to say that now is a probably a good time to start doing this as people find themselves even if it's just not commuting quite often um, well certainly some of us have got more time I know I'm, I'm very lucky to not have to be homeschooling so that certainly uh, frees a little bit of time for me so it's something I can definitely start doing um, and it's quite interesting, uh, what I'll, one of the things I was particularly interested in was that you can do it with existing software and existing tools, it's not a case, I mean there are things you can go out and get, but it's not a case of you having to be only really there to do this by downloading new stuff or purchasing new software or whatever, quite a lot of it is the things that we all have day to day, so thank you for that. Yeah. Um, I, so everybody can, if they have questions, we use the Q&A option along the bottom to raise questions. Um, it's, I know that often people have something they want to ask, so it's a good way to do that. But if not, then that's fine. I've got a couple of my own, actually. So one of the things is that as you're going through doing this stuff and you're kind of reviewing it and adding and tweaking and finding new things from what you've already got, how would... When, at what point do you call a piece and think, actually, I'm adding more to this than exists in the first place? Or when is it beyond its original use or sell but like you know one of the better phrase when does it hit its sell by date how do you classify that how do you so could you say that again Stephen so I lost you for a yeah second. so how would you quantify if you've got a piece of research that you're adding to and you're tweaking and you're, you're finding more things out about it is there a point where you think actually this is beyond its use now it's see, beyond its sorry, original yes. use yeah, so, so you've done a synthesis and then uh, you, you know, maybe three years later, you're looking back at that and you've, you've maybe added as you've gone. I think, I mean, ultimately, that's a judgment call. It depends what's happened in your sector, how much has changed. Obviously, a lot is changing at the moment. Um, so whether we can look back at some research five years ago and make huge judgments based on the current situation, I think um, that, that I probably wouldn't recommend that approach. Um, but the elements of our customer journeys, the pain points, all of those sorts of things are perfectly valid. And um, if they're, they're tucked away in track and tracking data or in verbatims and they haven't been looked at, I think it's certainly a lot of value to, to going through and, and looking at those. So I guess if it's not a cop out, it depends. <laughs> Fine. And then another <laughs> question is that, so I can understand from a cost perspective, it is definitely a good idea to be able to do this uh, and to synthesize and to, re to kind of use what you've got and do it. But what about a time? How much time does it take? If you're not doing it on the, so I understand the point about doing it yeah. all the time and continuously yeah. doing, but if you go back to fresh, how long does it take to do this on a significant piece of research versus just doing a new piece? Yes, I think um, I, I, I mentioned it in the early part of the presentation that it, a short piece of synthesis, I mean, you could do in an afternoon, just quickly putting together what you had on a particularly niche topic. Um, if it's a large piece of synthesis, it, it will take weeks because um, a lot to read, a lot to go through. And that's, you know, that's dedicated time, of course. You may feel you don't have that. And that's where 
people would, would turn to, to people like me to, to provide that, that service. So yes, it takes time, but it also takes time to have lots of meetings with agencies to decide on the best uh, new primary method. It also takes time to put together the brief. It takes time to, to read all of the proposals that come back and field the, the questions from agencies to pull the sample together to, you know, I mean, I don't want to tell you, Jos, I've, I've been in your shoes, but that, but the whole, the linear research project process also takes a lot of your time. Strip all of that away. Yeah. You might be amazed how much extra time you do have. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, so thank you for joining us, Dan. Uh, it's really appreciated, especially doing it twice in a week. That's, uh, that's really uh, dedicated. And um, thanks for everybody else for dialing in as well. Um, the, the playback of this webinar will be available on the Aura website and our YouTube channel and a couple of people have asked as we've been going through. Um, and the next uh, webinar will be on the 26th of May and it's on uh, the dark art of semiotics, a, a great case study from Danon on how semiotics helped shape the, a new product for Activa and help them tap into a new and younger audience. So. As ever, you can sign up to that through the Aura website, so please do that. And we look forward to hearing from you all and hearing and sharing it with you then. Thank you very much.